Why was a skunk on, skunk on Santa's naughty list? Because he was a real stinker. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like eggnog? I've never tried it before. I think my mom's like, eh. <laughs> Why does Santa use GPS? He doesn't want to be a lost clause. <laughs> What do you think your dad wants for Christmas this year? Me. Oh. Have you been good this year? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Hey guys, my name is Bonnie Pruitt. On December 18th at 6.30, we are having our annual Very Merry Christmas event. This is a fun-filled evening full of um, lots of family-oriented kinds of things like decorating cookies and playing games together. It will be a great time. Whole church is invited, and you can sign up on the church app. I really hope to see you guys there. I hope everybody here can attend. Good morning, Northwest. It's so good to see you this morning. Hopefully, you grab your communion on the way in. Um, here at Northwest, we take communion together every week. So if you forgot to grab it, you can do that at any point. It's located on tables here in our worship center and also in our lobby. If you are new to Northwest, we would love to connect with you. It's very simple to do that. You can text the word Northwest to 94000. Follow the text prompts. Again, it's a really easy way to get involved and get um, connected and know what's going on here at the life of our church. And then once service is over, if you would head to our welcome desk in our lobby, um, one of our guest services members would love to speak with you and we have a little gift for you as well. I'm gonna pray for us and then we're gonna get started. Lord, I thank you so much for this beautiful day. I thank you for the beautiful sunrise this morning, Lord. Um, I thank you that we can come together in your house and worship you and praise you, Lord, and learn more about you. And I just pray that you would prepare our hearts today um, to receive everything that you have for us, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's stand, church.
Merry Christmas. How are we doing this morning? All right, there we go. <laughs> well, hey, I'm excited for this morning. I'm going to read us just a little bit of scripture, shock and surprise to all in the room about what we're about to, what we're, what we're in, what we're doing, and who our God is, who it is that we're worshiping this morning. Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Some translation says, I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's a psalm that we're all familiar with. It's one that I grew up memorizing. But what has struck me the last few weeks is, even though I walk through the valley, it's his goodness and mercy that follows me. Though you're walking through something, and we're not promised an easy life. Scripture tells us that all throughout. But we're promised that his goodness and his mercy follows us. No matter what we walk through, we can claim his goodness, his faithfulness, his steadfast love that extends to the thousandth generation. So would you continue in worship with us this morning as we declare his goodness? you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days, I've been held by your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay in my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Come on, sing it with me. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God love your voice You have led me through the fire And in darkest night You are close like no other Oh, I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I'm gonna sing of well, the goodness of God Sing of your faithfulness every morning, every day. 
That stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. Yeah! And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. Gospel truth of all shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Church, you can be seated. We're gonna move into a time of communion. I love that song. I love that opening line that Jesus came running after us with mercy in his eyes. I wanna share a little bit more scripture this morning. Out of Exodus 34, Moses has come back to the Lord to receive the Ten Commandments again after the nation of Israel was worshiping a golden calf. And in true guy fashion, he got mad and threw something on the ground. And the Lord reveals himself to Moses in a very personal way. And he says to Moses, I am the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children, to the third and fourth generation. Upon first reading, it's a little odd that God would finish that he will visit the iniquity of, of generational sin, but that's not the case. You see, he's not punishing us for something we didn't do, but he's visiting it. He's coming after it. He's coming after us to refine us, to call us to something deeper and to more. And we see that now, some few thousand years later, through the person of Jesus. It's through him that he visited us in our sin and our transgression, our iniquity. That's why we can stand here today. That's why we take this bread and this juice together. That's why we can stand here with thankfulness. So I'm gonna give us a second just to be before the Lord, just to confess anything and to come out on that other side with praise and thanksgiving in our heart. So let's be still and then we'll take the elements together. On the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he gave thanks and broke bread and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Eat in remembrance of me. So we'll take that first layer together. 
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is my blood of the new covenant. Drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, we declare the Lord Jesus' death until he comes. Let me pray for us. God, you are merciful and kind and you have visited us right where we are, unafraid of our sin and here to redeem us. God, may everything we do be done to worship and reflect your goodness and mercy. God, would you be with the rest of the service as we worship you through your word. May you turn lives around and expand your kingdom. And we come with humble hearts. We pray all these things in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. So tell me about your Christmas traditions as a family. Christmas morning, we will have donuts together as a family. And for the people that know me in the church, they probably think that's funny because of what I do for a living. But my parents did it when I was a kid, so we're doing it with, with our children now. And another thing we do is elfing, where the kids will buy neighborhood presents and put it on their doorstep, ring their doorbell, and run and hide so that they're not seen. Tell me a story about one of your Christmas traditions. During elfing, the boys going to one of the neighbor's house. They didn't have a place to hide after they rang the doorbell, so they just laid down in the person's front yard. They thought they weren't seen, but everybody in the neighborhood saw them. My favorite uh, Christmas tradition is putting up the Christmas tree and baking cookies and cooking a lot of food. Another one of our traditions is to travel up north to uh, see our family and friends. What about you guys? I like uh, wear my pajamas at night. My favorite is open up presents. Sometimes if we're lucky on Christmas Eve, our mom would let us open up one present on Christmas Eve. Back in India, um, we go Christmas morning services, and then my mom will make lots of uh, Indian food, mutton curry and chicken biryani. What dad was saying, you get to open a present on Christmas Eve. I think I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see. Good morning. I'm Josie Fitzgerald. I've been a member of Northwest Church for over 10 years. I currently am part of the Stevens Life Group, which I thoroughly enjoy. But my greatest pleasure is I serve as a guide on the guest services team. And I really enjoy meeting and greeting new people, people who have been here, and just everyone who comes to visit our great church. Good morning. My name is Angel Perkins. And I've been attending here since um, 2020 with my family. Um, we were lucky to get plugged in right before COVID started. So that really helped us in our transition here. Um, I'm also members of the Rice and DeRosa Life Group. And I also serve um, on the guest services team with Josie. And it's really special to get to serve alongside of her because I still remember the day she greeted us when we first came as visitors. I'm also part of the women's leadership team here. And I just want to make sure that you guys all know about our next event coming up on Saturday. And we have lots of great things coming up um, in 2023. This morning, we're going to be reading from Luke 1, 5 through 17. And in the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Abram, I mean, sorry, of Aaron, and, his, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blameless in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, and he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of people were praying outside of the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice in his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdoms of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And all of God's people said, This is the word of the Lord.
Um, such a good morning. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you guys. See, now I can't do anything. To, see, this is what, you know, you mess with traditions. This is what happens. Let's try that again. Good morning. See, okay, all right, I, tried to, I was trying something new on y'all, and I guess that just didn't work. That's okay. Uh, it's good to see everybody this morning. I'm excited to be here. I hope you are as well. If you're new with us, let me introduce myself. My name is Jay Rice. I'm the lead pastor here at Northwest, and it's an honor and a privilege to be here, and I say that every week. I know it's, it's kind, of, kind of tradition now, I guess, to say that it is an honor and a privilege, but I really mean that. I really love what I do. I love being able to stand up and preach God's word and to be used in that way. And again, it, it is just my blessing to be here. I hope you're, you feel blessed as well. A um, couple things real quick before we dive into um, our sermon this morning, into our text. Um, Angel mentioned uh, about the, a women's event that's coming up this, this Saturday. Um, I hope a lot of you ladies will participate in that. It's gonna be amazing. Um, we have this thing called an app. Uh, you all heard of apps before. Everybody's got apps on their phone. That, I, I was thinking about this the other day. I don't know anybody who doesn't have a smart device anymore, uh, who doesn't have a, 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 either an iPhone or an Android phone, some kind of something. And so apps are just part of life. They're ubiquitous. Everybody's got them and every company seems to have one. And the church has one as well. And let me just tell you, this is the best way for you to find out what's going on in the life of our church, the best way to follow along with what we're doing, this is how we sign up for events, this is how we communicate most, is to, is to get that app. If you don't have our app, you need our app. Because in that app, you'll find out about the women's event, you'll find out about men's events, you'll find out about kids' events, you can sign up for Very Merry Christmas, you'll get details on our Christmas Eve service. I mean, there's a lot of things just in December alone that are happening, and that app is your best friend for this season. Let me just tell you, it, you need that app. There's a QR code on the back of the chairs. If you don't have the app, you just scan that with the camera on your phone. It'll take you to uh, the Google Play Store or the Android Market or whatever it's called. I have iPhone, so I, I just go to you know, the App Store. Um, whatever it's called for, for all of you non-Apple people. Um, and so it'll take you there and then you can download the app directly. You need that. Just, just I'm telling you right now, you need that app. Um, it's, it is really good, it's important to have. And so I wanna put that out there to everybody and remind you of that. Um, we're gonna pray this morning one more time, and I know we've prayed a bit, but we're gonna pray again today, and I'm gonna ask all of you to do me a favor. We're gonna pray for someone in particular this morning. Um, there's a, a, a lady in our church, her name is Lisa, and she is currently in the ICU today. Um, she is in a tough place. She's in a tough spot. They, they was touch and go for a while. She's doing better. I went and saw her yesterday at the hospital, and she's doing a little bit better, but she needs our prayers. Her name is Lisa Hawkins, and so we're gonna pray for her this morning together as a church, and we're also gonna pray for our time together in God's word, um, and let's just go before the Lord this morning. Let's pray. Here we go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, first and foremost, we wanna just declare that you are good. And that you are God and we are not. God, and you hear our prayers and you listen and you care about everything. The big things and the little things. You care about us so much so that you would send Jesus to a manger 2,000 years ago and ultimately to a cross. And I never want to forget that. I never want to forget your goodness. We sang about it this morning. How your goodness is running after us, God. We want to declare that together as a church. But God, we also have these moments where life is hard, where things are tough, and we come before you now in a tough season on behalf of Lisa and Ed and their family. And God, I just wanna pray this morning. We wanna pray as a body. God, we, wanna, we pray that you will intercede. God, that you will show up in a powerful way. God, that you will bring healing. God, that you will restore Lisa to health, that you will bring her out of um, this tough place that she is in. God, we're praying for that we're expectantly. God, we're hopeful today in this place. And so, God, we, we just come before you. We lift this family up to you. God, I ask that you hear our prayers and you respond. God, I also want to pray for comfort and peace and rest for this family. As many of us know, being in a hospital room, there's no rest there. Wondering and waiting and worrying, it's hard to find rest. But God, I know that you can overcome that. You can show up in power and you can bring sleep 
you can bring peace. You can bring that peace that passes all understanding. And so, God, I pray that over this family this morning. We pray that as a, as a body together for the Hawkins family. God, would you hear our prayers? Lord, as we open your word together in this place, as we dig deeper into the story that is so familiar to so many of us, God, I pray that you will speak. God, I pray that you will show up. God, I pray that you will illuminate the text to us. Help us to understand. Help us to be changed. Help us to be challenged. Encourage us today in this place as we open your word together. God, we love you so much. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Christmas is a season of stories, isn't it? It's a season of stories. We just watched a couple on, on the screen. We're gonna do this every week. We've been interviewing people and trying to figure out, okay, what is your story? Tell us one of your stories from Christmas. I, I love hearing other people's Christmas stories. I learned something, this, this whole thing called elfing. I've never heard of that before. Uh, so I, I think we need, that's something we're gonna try in the, in the rice. I'm excited about that, um, to try that, because this is part of the power of Christmas, isn't it? It's stories. We love to tell stories. All of us have stories of Christmas. If you and I sat down over a cup of coffee and, and, we said, and I said, tell me, tell me some of your Christmas stories. I, I don't know anybody that would struggle to think of a story to share. We have stories from our childhood, right? We have those stories of, oh, I prayed for this present and I hoped and Santa brought me this gift. I woke up on Christmas morning, ran downstairs and there it was under the tree and we have those kinds of stories. We have those stories of those family dinners where somebody forgot something or somebody's chair fell over or it was, you know, oh, somebody came and they surprised people. Nobody thought they were gonna show up and they came at Christmas. We all have those kind of stories. Some of our stories are, are, are fun and exciting and just joy-filled. Some of us have tougher stories at Christmas. We have stories of loss. We have stories of, of difficulty and challenge. Somebody was supposed to come and they didn't. Or it's the first Christmas after we all have stories. Christmas is a time of stories. And we even use that language when it comes to Scripture. When we talk about this season, right, there's this passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 2 that we call the Christmas story. Many of us sit together in our living rooms on Christmas morning and we read this story together. We call it the Christmas story. Christmas is a season of stories. And one of the challenges that we can have in this season, one of the things that is difficult at times is we become so familiar with the story, with this Christmas story, with Luke chapter two, that sometimes we can gloss over it, sometimes we can forget it, the power that it contains. Sometimes it can become just like the rest of our stories, nostalgic, full of great memories, but almost unreal to us sometimes. And that can happen with the Christmas story as well. And so this year in our series, our Christmas series, starting today, we're gonna dig into this Christmas story and we're gonna dig deeper. We're gonna pull back some of the other layers. We're gonna, we're gonna wade deeper into this story. Uh, we're gonna tie the Christmas story back to the Old Testament. We're gonna, we're gonna go through uh, more layers of the story than just Mary and Joseph and the shepherds. Because I want to try to open our eyes to the power of this story. So if you've got a Bible, you're gonna, I need you to open up to Luke chapter 1 this morning. I need everybody to open up a Bible or open it up on our app or open it up on you. I want you to follow along as we walk through the story together, as we begin to kind of set the stage. And every week, like I said, we're going to dig a little bit deeper. We're going to dig deeper in where we're going to talk about a, a lot of the backstory, some of the things that were going on behind the scenes that so many of us just miss when it comes to this story. So open up to Luke chapter one. We're gonna spend some time in Luke chapter one, but before we get to that text, I've gotta kinda set the stage for us. I gotta lay out some of the, the again, some of the, the behind the scenes groundwork as it relates to this story and why it's so powerful. So we need to talk about Israel for just a second. We need to talk about ancient Israel and some of their history. And so I'm gonna geek out a bit throughout this whole series. I'm just gonna warn you right now because I, I, I love this stuff. I really do. I, I nerd out completely about this, um, but it's important. It's important for us to do this. We gotta, we gotta dig into this stuff. So in ancient Israel, there were three offices 
uh, within within the the country of Israel, you, you can think of it kind of like three branches of government, so to speak. Just like we have three branches of government, right? The legislative, executive, and judicial. In ancient Israel, they had three branches of government. They had three offices. They had three positions of influence within culture. There was the prophet, the priest, and the king. Those were kind of the three offices in Israel. Now, many, we know what a king does, right? We, can, we recognize a king. He, he's in charge of the government. He leads the army, um, that kind of stuff. Even though we don't live in a monarchy anymore, we, we get it. We, we've heard that term. We know what kings are. Uh, priests, many of us know what that is as well. Right? Some of us maybe come out of a background where you, where you had priests that would stand on stage, priests, priests that would baptize or that, that would lead the church. Right? And Israel had priests. But then there was this role called the prophet. And we've heard of prophets before. Right? Some of us have used it, that term prophet or we'll say, hey, I'm about to make a prophecy. George is going all the way this year. Right? Like, I'm going to make a prophecy, whatever, or not, like, you know, whatever. Uh, we we kind of know what prophets are, but I think we get lost in some of the details of what a prophet actually was. Because we think prophecy is all about telling the future. Right? And that's how we use it in our, in our modern language as we talk about prophets tell the future. But that was one of the smallest things that prophets did. That was, that was one of the least important functions of prophets in the Old Testament. So prophets, their primary task, their biggest responsibility, the, the most important thing they did was not to tell the future, although they did that. It wasn't simply to perform miracles, although they did that. It wasn't to um, heal people, although they did that. It wasn't even really to teach people, although they did that as well. The most important part, the most important function of the prophet was to stand before the people and declare God's word to them, to say, this is what God wants you to hear, to speak on behalf of the Lord. That was the function of the prophet, is to stand up and say, okay, you guys have not been living the way you should, and so here's what God has to say to you. Or, hey, you, you've been knocking it out of the park, great job. Here's what God has to say to you, to speak, to be the voice of the Lord to the people. That was the function, the primary function of the prophet. That was their job. That was their role. And for centuries, Israel had these three functions, the prophet, the priest, and the king. But then Israel, well, they didn't follow the word of the prophets, and they didn't obey the priests, and they didn't follow the word of the Lord. And so God removed them from their place of prominence, and he first and foremost got rid of the king. Many of us know that story, right? The the Babylonians came in, uh, prior to that was the Assyrians, and then the Babylonians came in and destroyed the Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, got rid of the king. The kingly uh, tribe, the kingly line disappeared, um, at least from a position of authority, and there was no more king. They still had priests, they still had prophets, but the people didn't continue not to listen. They continued to reject the word of the Lord, and eventually got, God also got rid of the role of prophet. And 400 years before the Christmas story, the last prophetic words, the last voice of God was heard in Israel. And these are the very last words of the Old Testament. Malachi 4. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. The very last prophetic words spoken to the people of Israel prior to Christ said this. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And then the Old Testament closes. And that's it. For 400 years, the way the Jews reckoned it, 10 generations, there was no voice of prophecy. There was no prophetic word. No one heard the voice of the Lord. And then we get to Luke chapter one. So go, go open, uh, hopefully you're there in the text. We're in Luke chapter one. Um, we're gonna break this down and, and hopefully you'll begin to see how some of these things be, come together. Luke chapter one, starting in verse five, says this. In the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth and they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. 
Okay, now you should be picking up on some, some themes here. There, there should be some things that, that just kind of spark in your brain as you hear these first couple passages uh, from our text this morning. Right, so there's this guy named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, and Zechariah is a priest. Right, so prophet, priest, and king. Priests still exist. Zechariah is part of that priestly tribe. He's of the tribe of Levi. He's, he's of the, the, the sons of Aaron. And so he's one of these priests. And in that day, in Zechariah's day, they had 24 different divisions of priests. There's 24 different um, subgroups. There are little sub-tribes sub within um, the priestly tribe, 24 divisions of priests. And each division was called upon to serve in the temple twice per year. So this Zechariah of the the family, a tribe of Abijah within as part of this, this, this priestly division, um, his group was called to serve the temple two times a year. And they would serve for one week and they would handle all the functions in the temple. They would do the sacrifices. They would do uh, all the things. They'd clean the temple, whatever w- was required. They did that twice a year. So two times a year, Zechariah and the rest of his relatives would serve in the temple. And they said at this point, there's, there's probably 20 to 25,000 different priests within these 24 divisions, right? And so um, Zechariah, this is, he's in this season um, of his life where, where he's getting to do something special. The, the text also goes on and it talks about how Zechariah and Elizabeth are blameless before the Lord. Now, if you know much about the, the, the New Testament, there were a lot of people who pretended to be blameless before the Lord. They pretended to be blameless. They had this appearance of godliness um, but inside, in their hearts, they were filled, as Jesus said, um, they were like tombs, whitewashed tombs. They looked good on the outside, and on the inside was decay, but not Zechariah and Elizabeth. They're blameless not before the people, they're blameless before the Lord. This is similar language to what you'll see in the Old Testament as it relates to prophets and the families of prophets. They're blameless before God, and they're also, the text says, they're childless. And they're advanced in years. If you've read the Old Testament, this should be something that causes you to go, oh, I've heard that one before. I've heard that story before. I've heard of this before. Because you think about the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When it talks about their families back in Genesis, all three, their families, their parents, they were were childless for a season. They, They wanted children, but they couldn't have kids. And then God would intervene. God would show up in a powerful way. And same for Zechariah and Elizabeth. They're childless. They're conne- there's this connection back to the Old Testament. There's this connection back to some of the ancient prophecies from the early part of Israel's history. Some of the greatest prophets that we have in the Old Testament, um, they started out with, with a mom and dad who couldn't have children. And so the story, it's this kind of thread that runs through the pages of the Old Testament. And so God has been silent for 400 years. There's no voice of the prophets. There's, there's no word from the Lord. And then all of a sudden, Luke chapter 1, we begin to see this story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. who are blameless before the Lord. Zechariah is serving at the temple, but they're barren. They can't have children. And they're now advanced in years. And then it goes on. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 8. It says, now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. There's a lot going on here in just these couple of verses as well. So there's these 24 divisions in the priesthood, right? And there's 25 some odd thousand priests. And there's these 24 divisions in the priesthood and Zechariah's one of those divisions. Twice a year, he gets to serve at the temple. Two weeks out of the year. So the other 50 weeks, he doesn't get to serve. He doesn't get to to work in that capacity. He doesn't get to, to, to participate in that way. But twice a year, he gets to go and fulfill his priestly duty and manage things at the temple. But because there's 20 some odd thousand priests within these different divisions, not everybody gets to do everything. Right? Not everybody gets to um, offer the sacrifice. Not everybody gets to burn incense at the altar. Not everybody gets to stand in those places and offer the prayers. Not everybody gets to do those things. And so they would have to cast lots. They would cast lots every single, every single week to figure out, okay, who gets to do these different tasks? And it was random. It was completely random. 
Think about it. If you have a thousand people in one division and there's 10 jobs and you're casting lots, basically you're, you're throwing the dice to see, okay, out of that thousand, who gets to do these 10 things? Maybe, maybe, if you're lucky, once in your lifetime as a priest, you'll get to serve. You'll get to go and do what Zechariah did. You'll get to burn incense on the altar. Once in your lifetime, if you're lucky. And so here we see in this passage, they're casting lots and Zechariah is chosen. And most people would have thought, wow, that's so random. What a coincidence that this just so happened to be this way. But we know that with God, there are no such things as coincidences, right? And so that begins to help us understand more of what's going on in the story. Zechariah is chosen by the Lord on purpose to go and offer incense. The incense was represented the prayers of the people. The altar of incense was right outside of the, the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant sat. And so it was a very sacred duty. It was a huge honor for Zechariah to do this, to burn this incense on the altar. So it begins to open up more of the story begins to, to open up our understanding that there's more here than just nostalgia in this passage. Then it goes on in Luke chapter 1, verse 11. So Zechariah chosen, seemingly at random to everybody else, and his once-in-a-lifetime honor, he's going to burn incense on the altar, and it says this, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. The angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And again, if you know anything about the Old Testament, this language is so familiar, isn't it? There's so many commonalities in this passage between this New Testament and the Old Testament. There's this bridge that's happening here in the story. All, all through the page of the Old Testament, angels would appear to people. They would appear randomly. And what would always happen, if you know the Old Testament, every single time an angel would show up, what does the, the Bible would say, and the person was terrified. <laughs> they were afraid. They were scared. And I understand, right? If I, especially for Zechariah, if I'm going into the Holy of Holies and I'm the only person allowed in there uh, and I'm going to burn incense and all of a sudden there's this guy that appears, that would be scary, right? I, I went into my, my bedroom the other day and um, Carrie had set up a Christmas tree in our bedroom. I didn't know it was there. And so I walked in and I turned on the light and I did, oh, oh, oh Right? My heart dropped into my shoes, and that was a Christmas tree. <laughs> Imagine if all of a sudden there's a guy. <laughs> I get it, don't you? I understand the fear. And so this every time in the Old Testament, this is what happens. The angel appears. People are afraid. The angel always says in response, don't be afraid. Do not fear. Fear not, right? That's the same language over and over. And this is on purpose, God is doing this on purpose. He wants us to see how the New Testament is connected to the old, how this isn't random chance. This isn't just a story. This isn't nostalgia. This isn't just like any other Christmas story. There's planning here. There's intentionality. There's a reason for these things. And what does the angel say? He says, guess what? I know you're advanced in years, but you're gonna have a, you're gonna have a child. And the angel gives him the name. And the, and the angel says, it's gonna be this great, wonderful celebration, um, and he's gonna be filled with the Holy Spirit. All connections back to these, these, these birth narratives and these stories from the Old Testament. It's pull, God's pulling it together in this passage of Scripture. He wants us to see that there's, there's a, a thread here that's woven through the story. Even as he tells Zechariah, your son can't drink alcohol, he's not gonna, he's not gonna touch any strong drink, he, he's referencing a, 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 a role, a function of people called the Nazarites from the Old Testament, from the book of Deuteronomy. There's, there's this class of people, this group of people, they would take a Nazarite vow before the Lord and they, if they were going to do something special on God's behalf. And so he even references back to that, he's trying to pull this all together so that we can see there's more going on. 
Then it goes on, Luke chapter one, starting verse 16. And listen to these words and think about the very last two verses of the book of Malachi. The very last word God spoke before he went silent for 400 years. And listen to this passage, Luke chapter one, starting at verse 16. And he, his, the son John, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Quotes Malachi chapter four, five and six. Quotes directly some of the same exact words out of that passage. So just imagine, just imagine if you can, God has been silent for 400 years. He hasn't spoken to the people. There, there has been no prophet for 400, for 10 generations, people had not heard the word of the Lord spoken to them. And then Zechariah goes into the temple, the angel appears and says, your son, this miraculous birth that you're going to experience just like Abraham and Sarah did or Isaac and Rebecca did, Hannah and her husband, you're, they're gonna give birth and there will be a prophet again. There will be a spokesperson on behalf of the Lord again. And he uses the same language. He's gonna go in the spirit and power of Elijah and he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And so after 400 years of silence, God begins to fulfill that prophecy from the book of Malachi. He begins to fulfill the prophecies of old, the things that people had been waiting for for centuries. God begins to move. And many of us know uh, some of the rest of the story, right? Zechariah, what is it? he doesn't believe the angel, does he? he? He questions the angel, and so then he's made silent. Uh, he's not allowed to speak until the birth of the child, and people, they're wondering and waiting. They're, they're, watching, they're seeing the incense getting burned, but then Zechariah is not coming out, and they're starting to get afraid, and they go, what's going on? And he comes out, and he can't speak. And they oh, wow, he must have seen a vision but he can't relate to them what he's seen, right? And then finally at the birth of John, at the birth of John the Baptist, um, he's, his tongue is loosed and he's able to talk again, right? And, he, and all of these great things. And we know John the Baptist, we, we're familiar, many of us, with his story. He is this great prophet. He's this great prophet before the Lord and he goes and he, he, he prepares the people for the arrival of Jesus. He's this great prophet. And finally again, a prophet exists in Israel, and he's this model for us, this Old Testament connection for the arrival and the birth of Christ and, and the life of Christ and the ministry of Jesus. And so many people, they were, they were excited the fact that there was a prophet at all. It had been 400 years. But John, is, he's, he's, a, he's a forerunner of what Christ was there to do. Even in John's birth story and in his narrative, um, there's a parallel story that happens in Luke chapter 2. And you see some of the same commonalities between John's birth and the birth of Jesus and the ministry of John and the ministry of Jesus. But Jesus always surpasses John. Even in Luke chapter two, in Luke chapter one, as the angel appears to Mary, Jesus' story supersedes John and is greater than the story of John because while John was a prophet, Jesus, as we'll discover, he's the prophet, John's the preparation for the arrival of Christ. John is the first prophet. Jesus is the final prophet. He's the prophet. And this is the language that the New Testament uses about Jesus. The New Testament refers to Jesus often as the prophet. And it connects back to the Old Testament. It connects back to these ancient prophecies, this, these ancient words from the Lord, all the way even back into Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18 Moses says this, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore lest I die. 
And the Lord said to me, they're right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And look at this. I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. God, uh, Moses is not referencing John the Baptist or any of the other Old Testament prophets. Prophets, he's talking about Jesus, who's the final prophet. And even in Jesus' ministry, as Jesus is on the earth, people began to see, they began to understand that Jesus was more than just a man. Luke 7, Luke 7 verse 16, Jesus is performing miracles, and this, this is what it says, fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. Matthew 21, 11, and the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. John 4, 19, even to an outsider, someone who wasn't an Israelite, someone who wasn't part of that backstory, the woman said, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Because while the birth of John is important, the birth of Jesus is the fulfillment and the culmination of all that God had been doing up until this point, all that God had been teaching and saying, and all that God had been planning for his people. There's more to this story than so many of us even realize. But it raises the question, okay, so what's the point? Why does this matter? I mean, this is great, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's nice to, to get some of the information that maybe we didn't possess before. It's neat to know, oh, there's 24 divisions of priests. That's great. Maybe if I ever go on Jeopardy, then I'll remember that and I'll be able to win some money. Okay, that's nice. So what does this matter? Why is this important to us? Why do we need to know that God was moving in this way. Why do we need to know that Jesus was not just a prophet, that Jesus was the prophet? Well, for some of us, for some of us, we come to the season of Christmas and we view the Christmas story with nostalgia, with rose-colored glasses maybe. We, we view it as one of those quaint stories like we tell to all of our friends about that one time we got the bike under the Christmas tree. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that nice? Wow. Okay, what's for dinner? <laughs> we need to understand, some of us, this is what we need to hear. We need to understand that the birth of Jesus wasn't just random. It wasn't just some story that we celebrate with presents and trees. That God had been laying the foundation for the birth of Christ since the very beginning of human history. That there's nothing random about the Old Testament. There's nothing random about what God was doing in Luke chapter 1. There's nothing random about what God is doing in Luke chapter 2. That God had been planning this all along. That there's more going on here than just some, some people sitting around telling a story. God had been preparing people that there's truth here, that there's, 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 there's something deeper going on. Some of us need to understand that. Some of us need to, to grab a hold of this idea that there's more to the story. Some of us, we need to understand that Jesus isn't just a voice. Jesus isn't just a prophet, but Jesus is the prophet. He's the voice. Because right? some of us have forgotten that. In the world where we're just filled with all different kinds of opinions and all different perspectives and all different kinds of understandings. In a world that says, you know what, all voices are valid. All religions lead to the same place. All faith systems, they basically teach the same thing. Um, Jesus is just one of many. We need to understand that Jesus is more than just one of many. Hebrews 1 says it like this, and I love this passage. Hebrews chapter 1, starting verse 1, says, Long ago, and many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And he goes on, he says this, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power, talking about Jesus after making purification for sins, he, Jesus, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. When Jesus was born in that manger, he wasn't just a baby. Born to, a, to an unwed pregnant teenage mom. There's more to this story 
Jesus isn't just a voice. Jesus isn't just a prophet. He isn't just a good moral teacher who has some nice things to to show us about life. Jesus is the exact imprint of God himself. And when he speaks, he speaks the very words of God because he is the word of God. He's not just a baby in a box. He's the word made flesh. This is what the book of John tells us. John chapter one, in the beginning was the word, talking about Jesus. The word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him not, was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And some of us need to be reminded of that today. Some of us came in today wanting to hear from God. We wanted to hear the word of the Lord. Well, we have the word of the Lord. It's called Jesus. Some of us came in wondering what we should do about certain decisions in our life. We've got these things that are before us. We have these questions. We need to hear from the voice, not just a voice. We need to hear what God would have us to say, and we do that by digging in to the words of Jesus. He's not just one opinion among many. He's not just one thought for us to ponder and to reflect on. He's the thought. He's the word. He's the only one we should be listening to. He's the one we go to with our questions. He's the one we go to with our problems. This is why we read the Bible. This is why we study the pages of Scripture is to hear from God himself, not just to have an extra opinion to add to the list. That's part of what we need to understand. Jesus is the prophet. He's the word of the Lord to you and to me. Not just to Zechariah and Elizabeth or the, the disciples when he walked this earth. His word is to you. And so if you've got these questions today, if you've got these these things you've been wondering today, are you going to Jesus and saying, okay, Jesus, what does your word say? How would you have me live? What do you want me to do with my money? What do you want me to do with my time? How would you have me treat these people that maybe aren't treating me so well? You're the prophet, you're the word, you're the voice. Are you listening? Are you listening to what he would have you say? Or are you putting Jesus in that category with everybody else? Maybe a little better sometimes, but, well, he's just one of many. So many of us do that. We don't even realize we're doing it. Well, maybe this year at Christmas, it's time to circle circle back and recognize that his voice should be the only one we listen to. His voice is the only one that matters. So here's what I want to do as we close. We're going to sing a song here in just a second. We're going to lift our voices to the Lord, and we're going to uh, praise him and celebrate all that he's done for us. And as we do that, I want you to, to try and think about where Jesus' voice rates in your world, especially if you've got those questions especially if you've got those, those decisions, those problems that, that you're wondering, okay, how do I handle this? What do I do at work? What do I do with my kids? What do I do with my friends? Are you listening to the voice of Jesus? Are you taking it to Christ? Are you laying it before his word and saying, okay, how would you have me function then, Jesus? Or is he just one of many? And if Jesus isn't the primary voice you listen to, If you're not going to his word and saying, okay, Jesus, how would you have me live? As we sing, I wanna challenge you and encourage you. Make that, make a change. This year at Christmas, begin to to shift your focus and say, okay, Jesus, I'm gonna listen to you first. Whatever that means, whatever that looks like, you're the prophet, not just a prophet. You're the voice, not a voice. What would you have me do? And that's how I'm going to live. I encourage you to think about that 
and pray about that as we sing this last song. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, God, we come to you today needing to hear from you. God, it's easy to forget who Jesus is sometimes, especially at Christmas, because it's the story we know so well. It's easy to forget, or to maybe not forget, but to just lump Jesus into one option of many. One way of looking at things in the midst of so many other ways of looking at things. One voice of advice in the sea of other voices. It's so easy to do that. And then to pick the one that we feel is best or the one that that feels most right to us or the one that we like most. But God, as we sing today, Lord, as we go through this week, God, I'm praying, God, that you will help us to begin to put Jesus and his voice in its rightful place. Help us to understand that Jesus isn't a prophet, he's the prophet. And that everything we engage with, and in this story, everything we see in this passage is set up for us to see Jesus as he truly is. God, would you speak that into us this morning? If we need to, to move the voice of Jesus to front and center, God, would you give us the strength to do that? Would you challenge us in that way in this place? God, would you encourage us this morning to listen to you first and only? God, we love you so much. Would you speak to us now? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. People come together, strange as neighbors, a blood is one. Children of generations. Of every nation of kingdom come. Don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high and feed on evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. Take courage, hold on. Be strong, remember where our help comes from. Let the church sing. Up on his throne, 
Would you place them here today? Come on. Swing wide, all you heavens. Let your praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All these children with clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. We'll swing wide, all you heavens. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All these children. Name is Jesus. Oh, swing wide, swing wide, oh you heavens. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. Oh creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All oh, these children, clean as the hearts, good praise to God. His name is Jesus. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in His blood. Yes, it is. Jesus, God of heaven, your friend forever, His kingdom. Swing wide, swing wide, for you have. Come down, all creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All these children, clean as your hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. We sing that name one more time. Come on. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation. Is in his blood. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Forever. His kingdom come. Awesome, awesome. I just want to remind you before we go if you need prayer, if you need someone to pray for you, Maybe you got all things going on in your life. Maybe it's a tough season for you. It's Christmas. I don't know. Whatever you need to help with or prayer for. We've got members of our prayer team right over here. We've got a prayer room right over there. Go spend some time in that prayer room. Get prayed over. Get prayed for. You don't have to go into deep, dark details about everything that's going on, but they would love to pray over you today. I hope you'll take advantage of that. As we go from this place, just a reminder, um, when it comes to giving here at Northwest, we ask people to do one of three things. You can go online, nwcc.net slash give. You can give through our app if you have the app, or you can give if you're physically present in the room in one of the boxes here or in the boxes on the outside in the foyer. Thank you in advance for your generosity. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you all. We'll see you next Sunday.